Well, today we're concluding our message series, Praying with Jesus. In this series, we've looked at the Lord's Prayer. We've gone through it very carefully. We've looked at each phrase in the Lord's Prayer, and we've expanded on it to try to understand better what Jesus was trying to, trying to teach us. And I, I assure you that if you're putting into practice what you've learned, what Jesus is trying to teach us through the Lord's Prayer, that you will be praying more powerfully and more effectively. Now, today my teaches is, is entitled Passionate Prayer. We're going to be looking at another portion of teaching of Jesus on the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Luke. We are going through the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. It's, it's in two places. But Jesus gives us, us some additional teaching in Luke chapter 11 that I believe will give us further insight into prayer. Now, what is Passionate Prayer? That's the title of the message that I've chosen today. Well, first, let's look at what passionate prayer is not. A passionate prayer is not prayer where you can barely keep awake when you're praying, like this morning, right? That wasn't passionate prayer for me. Uh, passionate prayer is not prayer where you're thinking about something else while the words of prayer are coming out of your mouth. Anybody ever done that? Passionate prayer is not prayer done because you're simply feeling guilty and you'd really rather be doing something else. Passionate prayer, let's look at what it really is. James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And so in this series, Praying with Jesus, we want to learn how to pray more powerful and more effective prayers. Now James here uses the prophet Elijah as an example of somebody who prayed powerful and effectively. Now, somebody might say, well, that was Elijah. That was the prophet. That was thousands of years ago. How does that apply to us today? We just put him in another category. God doesn't move like that today. I'm not Elijah. I'm not a prophet. So how does that apply to me? Well, James puts in this little line. He says, Elijah was a man just like us. Now, if you're a woman, you can say Elijah was a woman. No, no. Elijah was a person just like me. We're talking about he was just a human being, a normal human being. He wasn't some supernaturally empowered person, completely different than you or I. He was no different in nature than people today. In other words, James is saying that you and I can pray just as powerfully and just effectively as Elijah did. God has not changed. God is still the same. He's saying people are still the same. And so prayer still works today in the year 2014, just as it did thousands of years ago. Elijah was a righteous man. He was in a relationship with God. He was righteous. He was not perfect. We can be righteous even though we're not perfect. He lived according to God's word. He believed God's word and you and I can do the same. We can be the Elijahs of our day. And what did Elijah do? It says he prayed earnestly. We might translate that he prayed effectively. He prayed fervently. He prayed passionately. And miracles happened. And we don't have time to go into the story, but he prayed and it stopped raining. He prayed again three years later and it started raining. I mean, Elijah's prayers impacted the weather system where he lived. His prayers were powerful and effective, not because he wanted to change the rain, but because he was causing God's will to be done, bringing judgment upon the land. God wants our prayers to be passionate. He wants us to care about what we're praying for. How many people get passionate when you go to a Cardinals game? Anybody been passionate at a Cardinals game? You just later, mm, 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 mm. or do you cheer when a home run comes? Anybody cheered when a home? You got passionate about it, okay? Richard does. Richard gets passionate. Uh, God wants us to be passionate about praying. He wants us to care about what we pray for. He wants us to believe that when we pray, God is hearing our prayers, first of all, and that God is going to answer our prayers. He wants us to get emotionally involved when we pray. He wants to teach us today about passionate prayer. So let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now in your bulletins, there's a white page. And I'd encourage you to pull that page out. Looks like this. It has the uh, scriptures written out in here as well as the outline. 
On the back is a study guide that some of the life groups will be going over. You can go over it on your own as well to dig in a little more deeply to the message. Luke 11 verse 1 says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of, the, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So on this occasion, the disciples saw Jesus praying. They heard him praying. And they were impressed with his praying. And they said, hey, they thought to themselves, we, we don't pray like that. We don't understand how to pray. We want to pray like that. And so they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray better. And so Jesus began to teach them. And the wonderful thing is that what Jesus taught them was captured, was written down so that Jesus can teach us today if we want to learn how to pray. And so this morning as we go through this message, I pray that within your heart you're saying, Lord, teach me how to pray. I want to learn how to pray better. I don't have it all figured out. I know that there is a ways to go for my prayers to be more powerful and effective than that they are today. So Lord, teach me how to pray. You know, if you think you've got it all mastered, you know how to pray, then you're not going to be able to learn. But if you really want to learn more, Jesus wants to teach you today. Now in Luke chapter 11, Jesus gives a slightly shortened version of the Lord's Prayer. The basic elements are there as, as described in Matthew, but this was another occasion and uh, it's a slightly shortened version. So let's look at it as a summary of what we've covered in this message series. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And so let's review for a minute. The Lord's Prayer, as you can see, this is not the exact wording of the one we typically say. That was found in Matthew. But the Lord's Prayer is a pattern prayer. It's an example prayer. It's not a prayer that we should repeat multiple times a day, over and over again, without thought. That's not what passionate prayer is all about. The Lord's Prayer gives us a, a framework for praying so that we don't just have monotone prayers. God, help me with this. God, help me with that. Which is what we tend to do. There's different elements of prayer that make our prayers powerful and effective. So the Lord's Prayer, the example begins with worshiping our Heavenly Father. We're seeking to honor His name. We're thinking about Him first and foremost in our prayers, not about ourselves. Then we're praying for the kingdom of God to come in our own lives and through our lives. We want to live for God. God is not a genie in heaven that we just command to help us out. We are servants of God and we want to help His kingdom expand. Next, we ask God to meet our needs for the day. We do have needs, and we ask for God to meet them. And then we ask for forgiveness for our sins. We confess our sins. We ask God to forgive us. And we also make sure that in our hearts we've forgiven those who have sinned against us. No grudges, no bitterness, no unforgiveness should be in the heart of a believer. And finally, we ask for God's protection from falling into temptation. If we've just confessed a sin... Say, Lord, forgive me for sin A. Then we say, God, help me today and tomorrow to not fall into sin A again. Protect me. I need your help. And so, in Jesus' teaching in Luke chapter 11, he gives us a capsule version of the Lord's Prayer, and then he goes on to expand on how we should pray what I call passionate prayer. Or we might say to pray boldly. Bold prayers are prayers that we know are according to God's will. It's very hard to pray boldly if you don't know what you're praying for is according to God's will. But if we know something is God's will, we can pray boldly for it. Bold prayers are prayers that are going to have an impact for eternity. Bold prayers are prayers for God's kingdom to come in one way or another in our lives or in the lives of other people. And God wants his followers to pray Boldly, He wants us to pray passionately. And so Jesus told a story to illustrate for us what bold prayers are all about. 
Now, it's interesting that in Jesus' story, the prayer request is not for the person praying so much as it is for somebody else. And so it's not wrong to pray for ourselves, but we need to be sure when we pray to include others, to pray for others. So let's look at this story, which begins in Luke 11, verse 5. It says, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And so Jesus' story begins with us. He begins with you, it begins with me, and he says, suppose you go to a friend at midnight and you ask him for some food. Not for yourself, but for another friend who's come to you on a journey he's come to visit. Now in Jesus' day, this would have been a very genuine need. The friend has come to you on a long journey. He's come unexpectedly to your house. He's famished and the cupboards are bare. You have nothing to feed him. On Jesus' day, there were no 24-hour, seven grocery stores, okay? Uh, everything was shut. There was no food anywhere to be gotten. And so you needed help to feed this friend. Now, to grow in our prayer lives, we need to pray prayers not just for ourselves, not just for our own needs, but for the needs of others that God has put within our circle of influence. And as we pray for others, as we care about others, God is going to meet our needs as well. But those that just concentrate, their only prayers are for their own needs, uh, are not understanding, are not moving in the full dimension of powerful prayer that God wants us to move in. And God loves to answer prayers prayed unselfishly and boldly for other people. When we pray, we ought to pray persistently. So Jesus goes on with his story in verse 7. He says, Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. And Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up, get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And so what happens? The friend goes to this man's door at midnight at midnight, I'm generally asleep. Anybody? It's generally a sleeping time, right? It's dark. And so he goes to his door at midnight the first time. It, the door isn't open. It's locked. And so he yells through the door. I guess that's what he had. There were no intercoms back then. There were no cell phones. He didn't text him in the middle of the night. He yells through the door, I need three loaves of bread to feed a friend. He just come to me on a journey. Please wake up. I need these three loaves of bread. Man inside doesn't even bother to get out of bed. He yells and says, We're all in bed. The children are tucked in. The door is locked. I know we're friends, but this is a bit much. It's midnight, Buster. I'm not getting up. I'm not giving you anything. Go home. It'll be okay. And so the man has a choice to make. He has a decision to make. Can he, he should go home or should he persist? And the man persists. He starts pounding on the door. He starts yelling through the door. He has so much aggravation. The guy can't sleep anyhow. His kids are all awake. So he decides to get out of bed, open the door, and give the man his three loaves of bread so he can get some rest. Now, Jesus doesn't directly explain it right here, but as we'll see, he's teaching us how we ought to be bold and persistent in prayer. This man banging on the door and not giving up until his request is answered is an example for us of how we ought to pray. If a human friend will eventually answer our request, if we're bold and persistent, how much more will our Heavenly Father who loves us answer our requests if we're bold, if we're persistent, until the answer comes. Now, you might be wondering, well, why, why doesn't God just answer our prayers immediately? That would solve all the problems, wouldn't it? We just pray, and the answer drops down from heaven. Well, there are many reasons. That 
is a whole message or even a series in itself. Why all of our prayers are not answered immediately. But I'm sure you've learned, if you've been a believer for any period of time, that all your prayers are not answered immediately. Anybody say amen? Okay. It takes some time. Even though our prayers may eventually be answered, usually it takes some time. Prayers aren't answered immediately because oftentimes God wants to work in our lives. He wants to build our faith. He wants us to keep believing even in the midst of adverse circumstances, even when the answer doesn't immediately come. Sometimes prayers aren't answered immediately because God has to work out some circumstances for everything to work together for that prayer to be answered. And it takes some time. And so this morning... We're talking about passionate, persistent, bold prayers. Think about your own prayer life. Is there a prayer in your life that you've been praying, but it hasn't been answered yet? If you think long enough, I'm sure you will come up with a prayer that you would like to see answered, that you believe is God's will, and he hasn't answered that prayer yet. Don't give up. That's what Jesus wants to teach us today. Don't give up on praying that prayer. Keep knocking on that door. Keep praying boldly. Keep praying persistently. Keep praying passionately. And eventually, the answer will come. Now, to help us pray passionately, we need to understand the levels of prayer. There are levels of prayer. Jesus recognized that. And if we don't understand these levels of prayer, we're not going to be able to correctly prioritize our prayer lives. Now, this illustration of the friend at midnight pounding on the door and yelling through the door until the guy is so tormented that he gets up and gives him a request. That is an example of the very highest level of prayer. We're going to get that, to that in a minute. But it is an illustration of how we ought to pray boldly and persistently at every level of prayer until the answer comes. But Jesus concludes this story of the friend at midnight by telling us that we ought to ask until we receive. In Luke 11, verse 9 and 10, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask. Now this is immediately at the end of the story. He says, So, based on this story, I'm telling you, this is what you ought to do. So, I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you for everyone who asks receives. And so the very first level of prayer is the level of, <clears throat> of simply asking. The Bible says in James, we don't have time to look at it, that many people don't receive what they need from God because they simply don't ask. They just like assume it's going to happen or they assume they can do it by themselves. They don't ask and they don't receive. They basically leave all kinds of things on the table that God has for them but they never receive those blessings because they never ask. Now that may seem obvious, but a lot of people just simply don't ask for the things that they need, the things that God wants to give them. So we need to ask. We can't handle life on our own. We need God's help. Even the things you think you can handle, ask God to help you. And so rather than trying to meet our needs on, on our own, we ask God. And Jesus says here, whatever we ask for, according to his will, it will be given to us. And so this first level of prayer is important. Uh, it's, it's the lowest level. Well, you'll have many requests on your prayer list that are at the level of asking. There's many things we need to ask God for. I mean, they're important things, but they're daily needs. They're important things, but they're needs of the week. It's, it's not like super big high priority things. It's just the normal everyday asking things of life. Asking for yourself, asking for the needs of others. The second level of prayer is called seeking. Seek until you find. Jesus says, seeking you will find. He who seeks finds. Seeking is a more intense type of prayer. Perhaps you're seeking wisdom on an important decision. I mean, you've got an important life-changing decision to make. You know, should I... I don't know, take this job or take this promotion or not. It's going to have all kinds of implications in your life. 
that's a very important decision and you're seeking God's wisdom on this. And so this isn't just a, a little thing you, you, you know, like God, uh, keep me safe when I drive to church today. That's an asking thing, you know. Whenever you get in your car, you should ask for God's protection. But this is a more seeking type of thing. You need to seek because you need that wisdom. You can't get it on your own. It's an important, a very important request. And so finding what you're looking for through a seeking type of prayer is going to take more persistence. It's going to take more uh, boldness. It's going to take more effort. And the answer usually doesn't come as easily as, as just simply the asking prayer. And so you won't have as many prayers in this category of seeking as you do in the asking category. And many people don't find the answer to their seeking prayers because they give up. Because this is a more intense kind of prayer. It's going to take you praying longer. And so people tend to give up on this kind of prayer and just kind of, kind of wing it if the answer doesn't come. But if you keep seeking, eventually the answer to your seeking prayer is going to come. And Jesus instructs us to keep seeking until you find the highest level of prayer is knocking, knocking until the door opens. He says, the last part of verse 9, knock and the door will be open to you. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. This knocking prayer is a type of prayer that Jesus illustrates in his story of the friend, of, friend at midnight. It's the most intense type of prayer. Now, you're not going to have very many prayers in this category at any one time because it takes so much effort, it takes so much emotion, it takes so much time to pray this way. You know, when the friend is knocking on this door at midnight, yelling through the door, he, he can't be doing anything else. This is his, this is his, uh, his passion at that time. And so these are the kinds of prayers that, that occupy your thoughts throughout the day. You, you need the answer to this prayer, you need it soon, and you keep praying. You keep knocking, you, you're, you're going to work and you're saying, God, I need this answered. I keep knocking, I need this, I need this soon. I need you to, to come through on this prayer. You knock boldly, knock, knock persistently until God opens the door for you. And so these knocking types of prayers are for big things that are going to alter the course of your life. They're for big things that may alter the course of another person's life. And we need to knock with intensity until the door is opened. And so Jesus wants us to understand these, these three levels of prayer, asking, seeking, and knocking, so that we can set our priorities in our own prayer life as well. Now sometimes God will, will have a prayer that escalates from one category to another, from one level to another. Suppose you're asking God for the salvation of a, a family member or a friend. And you might have been praying and asking for them to find the Lord for months or even years. It's just something you keep praying and, and uh, asking God. And as you pray one day, you sense that God is, God is speaking to you. He's saying that I want you to do something about this prayer. Whenever you pray for something, you need to have ears to hear because oftentimes God uses us to bring the answer to our own prayers. And perhaps you hear God saying, well, you've been praying for so-and-so for so long. I I want you to go talk to them about me. So, whoa, you know, I, I just thought you'd do it, God. You want me to do something about this? You want me to actually talk to them? And say, yes, I do. And so then you move from asking to seeking God. Okay, you want me to talk to this person. I, I don't know what to say. Please tell me what should I say. Give me an opportunity to talk to them about you. Give me a plan of action. And you begin seeking God's guidance to carry out what he's telling you to do. And then say, you go, you speak to them. You sense that God is working in their lives. They're close to opening their, their heart to Jesus Christ, but they haven't made the decision yet. And you begin to knock. You say, God, they're close. I don't want this opportunity to slip away. God, open their eyes. I, I want you to give them the faith to believe. I want you to remove the distractions and the things that are blinding their eyes so that they break through and become a believer. And you begin to knock with intense prayer. This is the kind of prayer, if you ever woke up in the middle of the night and God put on your heart to pray for somebody or pray for something, it's that kind of intense prayer that wakes you up in the night. You say, God, I need you to come through on this. I need 
this door to be opened. And so you knock with intense prayer until the door is opened. In my example, until this person gives their heart to the Lord. And so as we pray at these various levels, we need to trust our Heavenly Father. Everything we've been saying, faith is required to receive the answers to our prayers. We need to trust that God not only hears our prayers, but He is there and He's going to answer. Now some people are afraid to pray because they're not sure they're going to like the answer God gives them. I've heard of people who, you know, say, God, I give my life to you, but don't send me to Africa as a missionary. Because, oh, I could not do that. You know, they, God, I'll do anything, but not this. Or they're afraid of what God may say. And some people literally don't pray because they don't want to hear the answer from God. Jesus assures us here that God only gives good gifts. He says in verse 11, and we're going stepping right through verse by verse in this passage. So all these things are related to one another. He says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Now these are rhetorical questions. And of course, the answer is no one. No father would do that. No good earthly father would give his son a dangerous creature like a snake or a scorpion if he just asked for something good, something to eat. And so we don't need to be concerned about God giving us something dangerous, God giving us something evil, God giving us something that's not good for us, something that would be harmful to us. When we ask God, God only gives good gifts. In fact, the Bible says that every good thing you have in your life is a gift from God. A gift from God. If you have something good in your life, no, you didn't earn it by your own power. You weren't responsible for it. It was a gift from God. God only gives good gifts. And finally, Jesus gives us some advice on the best gift to ask for. Ask for the Holy Spirit, he says. He says in verse 13, as he concludes this passage, he says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so here, Jesus' specific example of asking God for a good gift is asking the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. Now you might ask the question, well, I thought when a person becomes a believer, they receive the Holy Spirit. So what is Jesus talking about? Well, the Bible teaches in many places that believers should seek, people who are already believers should seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit after they believe. Being filled with the Spirit is an experience that can be repeated throughout the life of a believer. And so we should be asking God to give us the Holy Spirit in greater measure as one of His best gifts. Now when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, what difference does it make in your life? Well, being filled with the Holy Spirit will help you in your prayer life because the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit can teach us how to pray better, how to pray more powerfully, how to pray more effectively. We don't have time to go into all the verses that teach that. But I think this is one of the main reasons Jesus put this at the end of his teaching on prayer. Because we need to be filled with the Spirit. We need more of God's Spirit in order to pray effectively, in order to ask, seek, and knock. Being filled with the Spirit will help you in witnessing to those who need Jesus. The Bible tells us that the power of the Holy Spirit is required for us to be able to, to witness in power. Being filled with the Spirit will enable you to hear God speaking to you more clearly. And so Jesus teaches us to seek more of God's Spirit in our lives. And so today we're concluding this series on praying with Jesus. We're looking at Jesus' teaching and prayer. It's based on the Lord's Prayer. And so... I'd encourage you to use this teaching that Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer as a pattern for your own pray, prayer life. To keep your prayer life balanced. To keep your prayer life in proper order. So I encourage each of you, as I do from time to time, to set aside 
a daily time with God, at least 15 minutes, and that's a bare minimum, at least 15 minutes of reading God's Word and praying every day. And if you do that every day, you're going to want to do more because it's going to make a big difference in your life. In fact, the Bible teaches us to pray without, without ceasing. As you're going to work, as you're at work, as you're at home, to be praying, to be conversing with God, to be communicating with God. And we can only do that with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning as we're drawing to a close, think about some of the things that you've been asking God for in your own life. Prayers that you've been praying and they haven't been answered yet. What is God speaking to you this morning? He's saying, don't give up. If you know those things are my will, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep praying boldly. Remember the friend knocking on the door, pounding on the door at midnight. And be like him. Keep pounding on the door of heaven until the answer comes. Now, God isn't in there saying, I'm not going to give it to you. He's saying, believe me, when the time is right, the door is going to open. So don't give up because if you give up, the answer won't come. You see, the only thing that can delay an answer to a prayer that's prayed according to God's will is if we give up. And we forfeit all kinds of blessings because we give up prematurely before God opens the door. God has good gifts He wants to give you. Don't leave them on the shelf. Ask, seek, and knock. Let's receive everything He has for us. Now to pray to your heavenly Father, you have to be one of His children. He gives good gifts to His children. If you're not one of His children, then you can't have that communication with Him. To become one of God's children, you need to admit that you've sinned, that you've done wrong things. You need to believe that Jesus came to this earth, died on the cross, took your sins upon Himself, that you might be forgiven. Ask Him to forgive you and commit your life to following Him as your Lord and Savior. Let's bow our heads right now. And if you've never prayed a prayer like that, if you're not sure you have a relationship with God, if you wonder, if you're not sure if you're going to heaven when you pass on, God wants you to be sure. When you become a believer, He'll give you an assurance in your heart. So if you're not sure, that's an indication that you're not yet a believer. And so I encourage you to pray this prayer with me to receive assurance that you do have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or perhaps this morning you want to recommit your life to Him. That would be fine too. Say something like this in your own heart. Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I haven't lived all of my life according to your plan and purpose. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross that my sins might be forgiven. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you as my Lord and Savior. I commit myself to following your plan and purpose for my life. In Jesus' name, amen.